In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. What an absolutely gorgeous morning. As you walked outside your door, the weather was absolutely perfect. That is, unless you've checked the forecast for today. And then you walk outside and you have sort of a different perspective because you've been carefully monitoring uh, the forecast up against your child's sporting events. Uh, and you're thinking either, what an unexpected grace to wake up and instead of uh, it raining cats and dogs and lightning bolts everywhere, it's absolutely beautiful. Or you're thinking, is that next cloud over the horizon the one that's going to bring an end to this beautiful weekend that we've been enjoying? Um, and it diminishes the moment that you're in right there. <clears throat> However you look at this beautiful day that we've been given, the point is, is that our perspective, the lens that we put on, affects what we see. Go with me for a little bit. Back in time, 2,000 years, to about 50 years after Jesus lived, and a man uh, was infirm. His legs didn't work. They didn't just not work well uh, where he needed a, an aid, a cane, or a, a crutch. Uh, they didn't work at all. So much to the point uh, that his friends every morning would pick him up out of his bed and carry him to the archway, to the gate to the temple, the beautiful gate. And they would leave him right there by the beautiful gate so that he could beg for uh, food and money and for anything that he would need to be able to survive. And then at the end of the day, they would pick him up and carry him back and put him in his bed. Uh, and that was this man's existence. Going as far as that temple gate and then being taken back in. Why not all the way into the temple? Because, for goodness sake, you wouldn't want to potentially infest all of the other uh, law-abiding, uh, uh, faithful uh, people of God with whatever this man has, whatever infirmity he has that made him, uh, that made him uh, unable to walk, uh, so he would be allowed almost into the presence of God, almost into the temple. And then one day, Peter and John are walking by. They walk by that gate, uh, and this poor man uh, shouts to him and says, can you spare a coin? And like many who've come right before him, they say, no, we can't spare a coin. We don't have any coins on us. Uh, but what I do have, I do have is the power of Easter, the power of God given to me by God to be able to make this an Easter day you will never forget. Get up. And he doesn't just get up, he hops up. And he practically does a jig, he's so excited. His legs work and he has experienced Easter in a way few of us have ever been able to make that Alleluia our song. And the people are astounded. The people gathered around the temple are so in shock. What's going on here? This is absolutely unfathomable. Peter says to him, why are you so surprised? The God that you walk into that temple to worship is the God that impregnated Sarah well beyond the, the years of being able to have children, is the God that delivered your people out of slavery, the God that gave you this promised land. The God that has always been with you, always doing wonderful things on your behalf. The God of the impossible is the God who gave me the power to lift him up. So why are you so astounded? This is your story. This is your story. Fast forward a little bit to the gospel. We're actually we're going backwards uh, into the gospel. Um, and it's right after Jesus has been raised from the dead. Right after that Easter morning, uh, and not long after, uh, two men are walking from Jerusalem, despondent, confused, trying to figure out what to do next after the person that they thought was the one, the person that was going to change their fortunes, that was going to restore Jerusalem to, uh, to God's people, after he hung on the cross, they were walking back and they were talking about all of the events of the week. And walking right beside them was the risen Lord. But their eyes were shut. Their lens was changed. So they're talking about what happened. They're talking about uh, 
this, these women that came back from the tomb and found it empty, they're trying to figure out whether there's any credibility in that. They're trying to figure out probably where they're going. They're on their way to Emmaus. Uh, and as they're going, Jesus is asking them questions, and then he's opening up Scripture to them. Uh, and even then, they don't realize they're walking right by the risen Lord that they've been told is alive. Until he says, let's break bread together. And in the breaking of the bread, they realize this is the one whose body has been broken open for them. And then they go and they tell their friends, um, the disciples, they're all gathered up and they tell them what has happened and they're all kind of hiding out still. They're not seeking the risen Lord. They're kind of uh, uh, closed in. And walking through walls, Jesus appears to them. And not as an apparition, uh, but as a physical, concrete, living being. And he says, peace. And they are terrified. And he tells them, this is the story that you all have been walking in for so long. This is what I told you would happen. This is what the prophets uh, and, and the people that have shared the faith and the hopes of your people for generations have said was going to happen. And still, they couldn't put on Easter eyes. Still... They were skeptical. So then Jesus says what uh, many of us have had buddies that whenever they came over to the house would say, do you have any food to eat around here? And start going through the pantry or the refrigerator. Uh, he goes in and he gets some fish and he starts to eat and they realize this is God in the flesh. He is alive. He's alive. Easter is true. But what does it mean? How do we live with Easter eyes? The pretty famous Methodist bishop and now professor at Duke, they say he's the second most read uh, 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 priest or uh, theologian in the church by clergy. William Willimon was talking about his first year in ordained ministry. So he graduated from seminary, uh, and they sent him to some very, very small church in rural Georgia. And he said, you know, being from the South, um, and he thought he knew rural, but he said rural Georgia is a little bit more rural than, uh, than the rest of what rural might be. Uh, and he said he goes to this uh, church, uh, and it was, you know, you, to get there, you take a, a ride off 1508, and you go about five miles, and uh, you turn at the old post office, you go a few miles, and then the old oak tree that's no longer there, you turn there, and five miles down the road, you get there. And he said it was the worst church he had ever experienced in his life. And he said he served there for one year, which was a lifetime. He said it was miserable. He said there was actually, after a vestry meeting, or what they would call a board meeting, he said there was actually a fist fight in the parking lot. He said he actually, uh, during the same year, had to investigate a rendezvous or a liaison that happened in the very same parking lot amongst choir members. That one year lasted an entire lifetime, and uh, he was so relieved to get a call from a, another church in South Carolina. Uh, and he went to that church um, and uh, served, and he sort of became relatively well-known in the, the church. And he got called back to Georgia, to Atlanta, to Candler Seminary to speak uh, about all of the wisdom of being such a, a great preacher and profound priest. Uh, or minister of the gospel, and he's talking, and after uh, the first intermission, someone comes up to him, and he says, you know what, I just was ordained last year, and I'm serving at the very same church. And he said, well, you know, God bless you, <laughs> and help you. And he said, you know what, it's been the greatest joy of my life to be able to serve these people in this church. And William William on uh, says, you know, the church where you take a left at 1508, you go at five miles to the old post office, turn at the oak tree, go another five miles, and then you're there, that church? He said, yes. He said, you know, there is not a person who has any want within 20 miles of that church. He said, if they're hungry, they're fed. If they're underclothed, uh, they're given uh, 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 clothing. Uh, if they need their spiritual needs or their, uh, their emotional needs met, the, a, a minister goes out to meet with them. Um, he said, that congregation is absolutely alive in that community, meeting every need. William Willimon said, okay, so you can take 1508, you go five miles, you take a right at the podium. That church? He says, yes. He said, what? You have to tell me, is there something in their history that they've talked about uh, that changed them? Because that's not the church I remember. That's not the church where I served. And he said, well, hmm. He said, you know, there was 
uh, some talk about that always comes back to this Bible study. He said, you know, the Bible study that you started that they really didn't like at all? Uh, he said, you know, they, they, for some reason, decided to keep on doing it after you left, they, uh, you know, just because uh, that's what we do once we start doing something. You know. um, and said, you know, one night they were all gathered around and they were studying Paul. And they said in the midst of them, they had the most palpable sense that God was right there, that God was there with them, that God was calling them to be Easter people. God was showing them what they could be as the body of Christ. And they turned to that moment and they say that was the defining moment where they knew what it was to be Easter people. And they did. And they were. God calls us to be Easter people. Not just to go and do Easter things, to go and be uh, ambassadors of hope, to go and be the kind of uh, justice seekers or, uh, or people who go out and live the way the gospel calls us to live, but to put on the lens, to put on the glasses, to see resurrection, to see hope, to look at the world through those, those eyes. Those eyes that Jesus tells those who first noticed the resurrection to be able to wear permanently. I remember a time when I was in seminary, uh, Bishop Gulick um, uh, was listening to my uh, 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 whining again and again about being in uh, uh, CPE, our chaplaincy, and I go to hospitals and I didn't know what to pray, and I was trying to figure out, you know, that people uh, right at the point of death, and do you pray that uh, they get up and walk out of the hospital? Uh, do you pray for peace and comfort? Uh, do you look over and try to figure out what the family members are, are thinking or what the person on the, the bed is thinking? You know, and all of my prayers were mitigated through, uh, through me trying to figure out what to pray. And he said, you know what, Ben, you're not trying to twist God's arm into action. You know, God, God knows before you even ask. He said, but in prayer, you're pulling open the curtain for you and for the people in that room to have the stage set for God to happen what you're doing. You're pulling back the stage. You're putting on Easter eyes for yourself and for the people in that room. That's what we're called to do. That's what I encourage you to do, to go through this week looking for moments of Easter, looking for places that God is truly alive in the world. You know, in the uh, first century, when they would gather For the Feast of the Unexpected, think of what this feast is. When a broken body wasn't allowed in the church for fear of contaminating the whole, now the body of Christ gathers around this feast to partake in the brokenness of a body that was given for all of us. When we gather at that feast, they used to have fish. Now, Altar Guild, we're not going to get a cooler for uh, fish in our new sacristy. You don't have to worry about it. But think about that. That when they broke bread together, when they celebrated the Eucharist, they also celebrated that moment where the unexpected happened. Where Jesus appeared in the midst of them and said, I am here amongst you. The unexpected has become real. Open your eyes to the unexpected. It also harkens back uh, to that uh, miracle of the plenty, of the multitude, where all of the people are fed. So when they broke bread together, it was a sign of the unexpectedness of God, the miraculousness of God, the abundance of God, the transforming power of God to change our vision for the world. So as you take this bread and wine, partake of that broken body, and realize that body compels you to go out in the world and to expect the unexpected, to find healing and wholeness in things that look broken, to find hope in places where you also previously saw despair. Because in order for us to be Easter people, first we have to put on Easter eyes. Amen.